Hello, everybody, and welcome to the AE Dynamite Review Show. The AE Dynamite. Let's try that again. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the AEW Dynamite Review Show here on the unofficial WWE podcast. My name is Mimi Burris, and today is Thursday, March 18th, 2021. And uh, I'm excited to talk about this week's show with you guys, so let's just jump right in. It's about the 14 years it took me to go from undesirable to un-goddamn deniable! Oh, oh my god! Good god almighty, the rope just came off! Let me hear it, huh? Oh. 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 shit! Oh. Oh. Your AW World Champion, Kenny by God Omega. Because I'm better than you, and you know it. All right, everybody, it is a little after eight here on the East Coast, and um, and I've been up for over thirteen hours, and I'm not one to like to be up for more than half the day, so I'm a little tired. But I uh, couldn't be more happy than to sit down. Uh, could be couldn't be happier couldn't be happier than to sit down um in front of a mic and be able to talk about uh wrestling with you guys so this is a perfect ending to a long day for me i hope you have all had a wonderful week and a wonderful day yourselves and i hope you all had a great quarantine saint patty's day uh yesterday with the saint patrick's day slam uh version of dynamite um uh, my my pop for the show was penta in the hornswoggle hat just want to get that out of the way real quick. Uh, if you didn't see that, it's definitely worth uh, looking up. But let's just jump right into the show and, and stick to the usual format here and just go down the card so we don't miss a thing um, before we, we, we go match by match or segment by segment. I do want to say that overall, I really was not impressed with AEW this week. Um, not a great show in comparison to its usual shows. I hold AEW to a higher standard because they've proven that they should be held to a higher standard. But... um. Still some good stuff to talk about, and uh, and we're going to go uh, go through it all. All right, guys. So, yeah, like I said, a pretty pretty good show full of kind of some highs and lows, no pun intended. But um, we do have an email I want to read a little bit later, too, but we can get into that after we get through some segments, uh, you know, break this, break this whole thing up a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, we started off this week with a, a beautiful shot of the stable we now know as the Pinnacle, but... Uh, for those, you know, who, who may not have watched the show or haven't seen the show yet. I don't know why you're listening to a review podcast. But if you hadn't, this MJF stable <clears throat> with uh, Tully Blanchard and FTR and Sean Spears coming out of a fancy private plane, getting into a fancy SUV, wearing fancy suits, MJF's pinky ring, all the glitz and glam for the uh, for a perfect uh, hook, I guess, to get into or to get excited about hearing what MJF was going to have to say for later uh, on in the show, which, like I said, we will get to. And then we had our first match of the night, which was Cody Rhodes versus Penta. Um, and I was really excited for this match. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I was looking forward to this. I think Cody, it's hard to not look forward to a Cody match most of the time. And I was really hoping that this was going to be a great showing for um, Penta, uh, who has, you know, a lot of. I guess I can use the word credibility in the luchador scene and uh, and really brings a whole new dimension to luchador wrestling, in my opinion. But uh, I was severely underwhelmed with all that being said. Um, but let's get into it and I will, I guess I'll explain why in a minute. But uh, I like the idea of what they were trying to do, but I just, I think the problem was in the execution. So... So Penta uh, cuts a promo during his entrance or has, you know, the little split screen thing. And he says that he's going to break Cody's arm. So he has to take a early paternity leave. Um, it showed highlights from the face of the revolution ladder match to give a, a good context as to where this animosity for the feud between Penta and Cody was coming from. But I didn't like right, right from the jump how this match starts off, right? First of all, Cody comes out like if if I don't have any kids, right? But let me let me use my dog, which is not even not even close to the same thing necessarily. But if anybody was talking some stuff about my dog, I'd want to be I'd be furious and want to uh I don't know. You you get my point. I would be angry and fired up and uh Penta was talking about Cody's unborn daughter last week and there was all this fire and rage and then he just kind of comes out skipping along down the ramp to the ring 
And Penta is the first one to throw the first shot with um, hitting a senton, you know, onto the uh, onto the ramp. Just seemed like the roles were reversed there. I think they should have saw some more fire from Cody. I don't need all the fancy fireworks and stuff when you're, I don't know, this guy was talking about your kid, right? Your unborn kid. Um, so that already set the tone for just not, not the story not being told well, I guess is my point. And so... The story of the match is similar to what's been the story of most of Cody's matches as of late is, you know, going after the shoulder. Um, And I was okay with the kind of on and off selling at first from Cody because it's kind of been a theme for him, I feel like. Like, especially in the latter match, you saw just like the the non-selling of his shoulder at certain points wasn't like, oh, I'm not just not selling it to not sell it. It was more so... What am I trying to say here? It was more so like I have enough grit and um, and tenacity to push through the pain. And that's what I thought at least at the beginning, but we will get down more into the match on where just the non-selling became an issue. Um, there were some great chops from Penta to Cody in the corner, uh, a great backstabber by Penta to Cody. He Then on the outside of the ring, Penta sets up the barricade, not the barricade, but you know, that the steel guardrail. Uh, on on the outside, leaning up against another steel guardrail. That was awesome, Huracrana from Cody to Penta. But it, all of this kind of stuff was just like spot to spot. There wasn't, to me, there wasn't really a great like smooth story being told throughout the match, which you expect from these two guys. It was just, I think the best word for it was like underwhelming. Um, Cody goes for the um, the what's it called? Uh, suicide dive. They, I know they say tope suicida or something like that. Um, but I, I just call it a suicide dive because I like to be simple on this podcast. And, um, and so, yeah, it goes for the suicide dive and it was just kind of slow. And the way Penta hit the guardrail, like minimal impact. I don't know if I'm just spoiled by watching Ray Phoenix do suicide dives now, but I mean, even like a Seth Rollins or Daniel Bryan or someone could have done a better suicide dive. Um, uh, th- though I have to say there was a great Canadian destroyer by um, Cody in the uh, in the center of the ring for the near fall, and then um, there was what's it called? I, I don't know, m- remember if it was actually before or after that. But Penta kicks out of a crossroads. There was like a crossroads in the middle of this match, just randomly. It just didn't. This match did not warrant kicking out of a finisher, if that makes any sense. And I don't know if anybody else felt this way about this match, but I was just underwhelmed. Um, kind of a little all over the place, just like this wonderful podcast has already been, as we're about 10 minutes into it. I didn't love the the cadence of the match. I didn't love the story being told. I thought it wasn't being executed very well. I, I thought these two guys, with the amount of talent in the ring, should have just been doing a better job. Um, long story go away, the match comes towards an end, where Cody kind of just no-sells the um, this move that, you know, from my research or from what I've heard, I'm not a, I've never watched a lot of other promotions outside of of the major ones at least but supposedly this move that penta does is supposed to break people's arms and this is kind of the first showing it's had on aew and cody no sold it so there goes that you know any kind of threatening menacingness from penta went away in this match and uh and yeah so cody no sells that and then rolls up penta for the three count and uh boring finish to a boring match in my opinion and terrible job with that no sell and then so after the match right you get penta attacking cody um but when i say attacking i mean like throwing super weak little lazy punches at his shoulder it just didn't it was poorly done i think if i were to have booked this right which i don't i think aew does a wonder let me preface it with this i think aew does a wonderful booking job 90 percent of the time but i thought this just was a miss um and if i were to have booked this i would have had I probably would have had either Penta go over with a submission or I would have had it be a disqualification finish where Penta just didn't take off the, uh, like a submission while Cody was in the ropes and then you had the finish that we're going to get to or even if Penta lost, then I would have had Penta put Cody in a submission or something afterwards where it actually looks like he's doing something to the shoulder rather than like barely punching him there. It just looked weak and not this whole thing was just ex- executed poorly. But so the Rhodes family comes out, or excuse me, the Nightmare family comes out um, and and makes the save. I say that with quotation marks, I guess, because really, like I said, it didn't look like Cody was in a lot of danger, which is sad. Um, 
And then everybody comes out minus QT Marshall. And then QT Marshall comes out a little late. And he's like, what's going on, guys? And they're like, you know, WTF, dude, where were you? It just didn't excite me. Um, We get the QT Marshall heel turn. Like, this didn't need to be a vehicle for that. Too much, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen for this one segment. I think this could have been a great feud starter even if it was down the line between Cody and Penta and it did not succeed this was boring in my opinion just just a typical wrestling match that I could have seen anywhere and you know it wasn't all elite let me put it that way um and you're probably going to hear me say that a lot on this podcast uh, because there was a lot of things on this show that were not all elite um so yeah so that was my thoughts on that match I hope you guys enjoyed it more than I do but I'm a big Cody fan I don't know if I've ever said this too I he was my favorite in, in WWE for a long time, actually, which was weird. He was a weird pick, and people were kind of like, why, um, when I was a little bit younger. But uh, I just always thought he had so much talent, and he was so much better than what he was given, um, like you hear in the intro uh, to the show here. But um, he's a super nice guy, and I actually met him at like a local diner in my small town, my small hometown, and he and Brandy were just at the diner, and I didn't – didn't get a picture or anything, just went up to them, and, and it was actually after one of these, uh, one of those house shows where he had done the, uh, back, uh, moonsault off the steel cage, I don't know why I'm telling you guys this, but we're on a quick, on a quick tangent here of, um, yeah, he had just done the moonsault off the steel cage in the, uh, in a dark match in, uh, in my hometown, or not my hometown, a couple towns over, but, and he was at a diner that night, and, uh, and I just went up and said, you know, you guys were really awesome, I'm a big fan, yada yada, super nice guy. Just what you see on TV couldn't have been nicer, um, and uh, and so I'm a huge. Long story go away, I guess I'm a huge fan of Cody, and uh, and I also have high hopes for Penta, and uh, this just did not deliver. All right, guys. So the next segment was an interview backstage with Alex Marvez uh, with the Young Bucks, and he asked them, you know, how are you guys, or where's your mindset going into this eventual tag team title match with Death Triangle? And Matt Jackson plays off the two singles losses his last week and uh, Nick Jackson's about a year ago to Ray Phoenix. And basically says, you know, well, we're a tag team and uh, we're the best tag team in the world. So, you know, you might have beat us in singles competition, but we're a tag team. And uh, and yeah, so then Don Callis interrupts and uh, tells them that he brought a T-shirt for their dad. And the shirt says, don't slap knees or don't slap legs when kicking or something like that. Uh, funny, I guess. I popped a little bit, but I don't know. Wasn't wasn't the, the best wasn't the best AEW humor I've seen. Um, so Callis essentially says that uh, the Young Bucks suck now uh, compared to the way they were in New Japan. And that they should go and excuse me, and then they go back and forth about Kenny uh again, we've seen this before in the in Kenny Omega's house, supposedly, just you know you're a bad influence on Kenny. What have you done to him and the uh Callis says, well, the young bucks aren't elite anymore, just another tag team in their basement or something while Kenny is the god of wrestling uh, this was bad. Um, for a multitude of reasons. One, the Young Bucks can't act, uh, in my opinion, or at least well. Uh, Don Callis is a great heat builder, I think, but this, why are you burying your AEW tag team champions, right? Like, just as big of a title, supposedly, in this company, in a company with four total titles, you like to think that they're all prestigious, so I don't know why. This just felt unnecessary. It didn't really hit for me. Um, like I said, the Young Bucks aren't great in these kind of things, it just didn't feel organic. It felt forced. But um, And really, the job that this segment was supposed to do, which was continue to drive a wedge between the Young Bucks and um, and Kenny Omega, was pretty much done later on uh, in, in another match that we're going to talk about. But So I just felt like this was unnecessary and, again, just kind of poorly executed. But I like the story beat behind it, so we will talk about this more later on, I assume. So, moving on down the line, we go to the Jade Cargill squash match. Uh, I actually don't know if I wrote down the woman's name that... Oh, here, I did. Go me. All right. Uh, Jade Cargill squash match against Danny Jordan, um, who we might never see again because, wow, that German suplex was unbelievable. Uh, Jade Cargill, this was exactly what it needed to be. Let's talk about how amazing Jade Cargill looks. That's that's why they had this match, was so nerds like me could get on a podcast 
or talk it talk about it with their friends about look at this chick whose six packs six packs she probably does have multiple six packs but whose six pack is insane arms legs muscles everywhere the woman is beautiful and looks dangerous to throw it back to team bad naomi sasha banks and tamina if anybody knows what i'm talking about but really this woman is beautiful dangerous lethal she looks incredible and that's all this match was for um amazing german suplex like threw her all the way across the ring and then hits her finisher which i i I think it's called the jaded or the jaded effect or something like that essentially it's the glam slam uh the beth phoenix glam slam for those of you who, who know what i'm talking about but um and one, two, three, and that was the match, and uh, and that's all that seemed to be. I'm, I'm glad it didn't go any longer, really. There was, like, a big boot or something else, but really three big moves, bada-bing, bada-boom, like, we're out of here, uh, and Jade Cargo looks awesome. So, I, of course, she. there are a couple things that could get a little bit tighter here and there, but I'm not even here to talk about that. She can work on that little by little, and there's, like, no house shows or anything right now for these um, wrestlers to practice So uh, in front of a live crowd, so I'm... I'm I'm banging into this and uh and I think it was great and exactly what it needed to be no more no less um probably one of my favorite things on the show which is kind of sad but speaking of my favorite things on the show what a transition we are getting into the Pinnacle promo um aka the uh MJF's new stable uh and this was exactly what you would expect i mean you put a microphone in mjf's hand and you know you're gonna get greatness 9.9 times out of 10 um so they all come out to the ring tully blanchard starts uh off recapping the beat down last week says that they took down the baddest group in aew making their group the baddest group in aew and says that they are at the pinnacle of this sport because um, they're at the top of the mountain, nowhere else to go. I might disagree with that. I assume the top of the mountain is the championship. But no, nevertheless, I get the point. And um, says that uh, he refers, excuse me, he refers to the Four Horsemen and says that he was with the greatest group in the in pro wrestling at that time in his career and says that he wants to finish his career with the greatest group of in pro wrestling, a.k.a. the Pinnacle um, FTR, Sean Spears, MJF, and Wardlow. So, great little, little, uh, what am I gonna, what am I trying to say here? Great, uh, putting over of, of this new group from, uh, Tully Blanchard, a guy who definitely, you know, if you are a pro wrestling purist, you are 110% valuing this man's words and opinions. Um, and then we get the mic to MJF, uh, who, Happy birthday, happy belated birthday to MJF. Scary, that guy. He's only three years older than I am and is probably more successful now than I will ever be in my life. So, unbelievable the talent this guy has. And we're going to gush over MJF probably for a hot minute on this show because I think the guy is, if not the best on the mic in in pro wrestling today, one of, um, and a great heat seeker. And just really good at being the worst and the most annoying guy. Um, so I'm actually going to read to you guys some of the stuff that he said. Because I, I, I don't think I can give it or do it justice. Um, any MJF promo ever. But if you missed this, I want to make sure that you uh, you get to hear what this promo was. And if you didn't see it, uh, you should go watch it. Because me cutting MJF's promo is not going to be nearly as good as MJF cutting it. And if you did watch it, you get to hear it all over again. Because this stuff was great. Um But he takes the mic and he says, well, I guess I'm Judas now, huh, Chris? Pretending to like you was no walk in the park. It wasn't easy being the most charismatic man in pro wrestling and having to take a backseat to you for six straight months. Every time you talked, I'd have to fall as far back as your hairline. Right? Strike one on the hairline. It wasn't easy, but I sang and I danced and I pretended to like your comedy BS. Uh, Because this is a PG show. But it worked, didn't it? You thought you were taking me under your wing. Oh, I love this line. You thought you were taking me under your wing, but in reality, I was down there plucking you feather by feather. Like, such a great line. Uh, And then I convinced everyone that I wanted to take over the inner circle, when in reality, that was just an elaborate ruse so you wouldn't see what was coming. Chris, from day one, the goal was to kill the inner circle from the inside. I wanted to build my own faction on top of the remains of the inner circle, and boy, have I ever. 
We are the pinnacle, and we will take every championship and anything else we want. And right now, Chris, we want your locker room. And obviously, I'm getting that off of uh, AEW's website. And it's an abbreviated version of the promo, but I have to say, you know, he went after the hairline. Uh, I did that, what it did mention, he also goes after, you know, the weight of Chris Jericho again. Um, props to Chris Jericho real quick for, like, I, I'm sure he was fine with uh, having MJF bury him with this stuff. Um, because I really think he knows that MJF is, like, the next big thing and wants to uh, continue to enhance and better the talent. Um, because, obviously, Chris Jericho's in his 50s and he's not going to be around for so much longer. So credit to Chris Jericho. But also, like, as, as much as uh, MJF is burying Jericho here, he's also putting him over in a way. And putting over the inner circle really is like the baddest group in AEW, not just because they said it outright, but also to take the group down, he had to go in from the inside, you know, like that says something about how strong a group can be. And so, yeah, I mean, a great promo by MJF. This is one of my favorite segments of the show, and I wouldn't be able to do it justice by just, uh, nothing I say, I guess, is going to be able to do an MJF uh, promo justice ever on this show but uh, like I said if you guys didn't watch it go watch this this is one of the high spots in uh, in this week's dynamite and um, and later on obviously we get MJF putting the pinnacle logo over the inner circles uh, and taking the dressing room and I'm excited to see hopefully the inner circle is back next week and we get a response because super excited for this feud the amount of matchups they can do with this you get uh Hager and Wardlow again, you get Sammy Guevara and MJF, Sean Spears, Sammy Guevara, FTR versus um, Santana and Ortiz, you get another Jericho MJF match, totally different um, perspective on that, all this kind of stuff that you can do with these um, with these awesome new stables that are going to have probably a great feud until the next pay-per-view, I think which is full gear, but don't quote me on that, no, all out, you know, exactly, I can't even remember, anyways, Whatever the next pay-per-view is, I'm excited for this, and I think this is going to be an amazing um, multi-man match, whatever they end up doing, and uh, and a great feud. Just nothing more I can say about this than A-plus all around, you know. I think um, the only thing, maybe if I put were to put on spin on any of this, I would say I'd, I'd love to see a little something new from MJF's promo style, just because this is like a new development in his career. Just a little something new. It was kind of all the same stuff, but he was also kind of returning to the MJF of old in a way. So I get that theme, but I'm looking for a little, not like a little bit more, I don't want to use that word, but just a little something new because, I mean, he did such a good job of putting over um, the entire group and and even better, putting over himself over the rest of the group, which, again, just a great heel, dictator, stable leader does. But I'm just excited to see, you know, what new kind of dimension he can add, not necessarily to his character, but just his promo skills, um, if that makes any sense. And so, but yeah, like I said, you know, couldn't have asked for anything better with this. Um, they are, uh, this new stable is going to be something fun to watch, and this new rivalry between the stables is going to be fun to watch too. So, all right, we are moving on down the line. And I, if I'm correct, I think the next thing was the 10-man 10, 10 tag team match. I did not get to watch AEW until very late last night, so I am. I might have one or two things out of order, but nevertheless, we will make sure to cover everything and uh, in order or not. But next, like I said, yeah, it was a 10-man tag team match, and it was Jurassic Express and Bear Country versus Big Money Matt Hardy's, uh, what did he call it, a uh, dynasty or something? Enterprise. Big Money Matt Hardy's Enterprise, uh, which consisted of Matt Hardy, obviously, Private Party, and The Butcher and the Blade. Um, overall, I'm not going to spend too much time on the recapping of this match, but it, just some beat down on Jungle Boy, some beat down on Marco, Marco Stunt, excuse me, and some, you know, hot tag to, uh, Luchasaurus, I think at one point, long story go away, private party hit the gin and juice on, uh, Marco Stunt, and then Matt Hardy does his typical heel Matt Hardy stuff. And begs for the tag so he can come in and hit the twist of fate on an already essentially unconscious Marco stunt and get the three, get the three count. So, you know, what I didn't cover quickly in the recap, in that, I, I'm not even going to call that in a recap, in a quick summary of that match was um, that, you know, the problem or the way that they got the advantage, the heels got the advantage in that match was there was a, a miscommunication between Bear Country and Jurassic Express 
And uh, that is pretty much the story of this match. I don't know. I was bored by this, and I was disappointed that I was bored by this because, like I said, I think AEW handles these multi-man um, multi matches very well usually, but I just thought this wasn't handled very well. It was sloppy and not in a good way. And just poor execution, I thought. Um, but to lean on some positives, I will say that um, the Marco stunt uh, beatdown, essentially, throughout this match is very akin to... I don't know if anybody else gets these vibes, but my first thought is Hornswoggle. Uh, because you remember back in the day, right? And we're talking like Finley Hornswoggle days. Um, like, you know, post Vince McMahon, this is my... Uh, illegitimate son days uh god wrestling is weird sometimes but anyways um and when anybody would put their hands on hornswoggle like it was immediate heel heat like you just hated them because it was so annoying because he was such a little miniature guy you just never really even anno- how annoying hornswoggle could get especially i remember as being a little kid you never wanted hornswoggle to get hurt um and so definitely you know heat seeking from uh the hardy enterprise when they um, were all hitting moves on marco stunt i think it it i think obviously marco stunt is much more talented than hornswoggle but at least in the ring um but uh still kind of a same vibe and i don't know if anybody else felt that way so there's one positive there um matt hardy wanted to come in after you know all the work was done another good heat seeking tactic um and this is another story being developed out of the Battle Royale or Tag Team Battle Royale at uh, Revolution, which is, you know, Bear Country versus Jurassic Express. I just didn't, I thought the execution was just poor and like the st- typical, well, can they get along story. Like it was just, no, oh, they just can't get along, right? Like it's just boring. How many times have we seen this? And And like I said, I just, if this was a WWE match, I probably would have been like, this was great. Or not great, but just um, serviceable. But I expect better from AEW, and that's all this was was serviceable. So, so moving on down, I'm I'm done talking about that. Let's get let's talk about something good, which was the Moxley and Eddie Kingston promo in the back. Um, you had again, obviously Moxley and Eddie Kingston, and and I'm watching. I was watching AEW a little bit of a part of it with my fiance last night, and she was like, "He looks like he's got like ADD or is like on some cocaine or something." And I was laughing. It's like that's kind of Moxley's character in a weird way. Um, and I don't know if you guys ever heard the um, the Renee Paquette his first interview on that show. It was so funny. He talked about doing cocaine in libraries, and that's also all I could think of. But all right, stay, staying on track here. Um, so yeah, great, great promo backstage. It was kind of fun, cute, and jokey in the beginning. Um, they, I think they called Gallows some Toy Story character, but talking about how he has like googly eyes and uh, whatever. He call, they call the um, the Good Brothers, the Cheap Shot artists, and they live up to the name later on. We'll get into that. Um, but they set up the match basically by saying, you know, uh, Eddie Kingston. Again, this is another thing. Like, I could try to recap these these promos by MJF and Moxley and Eddie and whoever. But I just, I will not give enough justice to any of this stuff. But um, they essentially, uh, you know, Eddie Kingston gets serious and says, like, you guys. He quotes 50 Cent, I think, and, and something else. Basically, you know, we got to take care of the problem and you guys are the problem. And that's what we're going to do tonight. And, um... And so, yeah, like I said, I'm not going to do this enough justice, but I will I will say that it was a great promo and uh, leading into the match. But before we got the match, we had a backstage interview with Christian Cage. And um, this was serviceable, but boring. And uh, and I really feel bad for Christian. Um, Christian, excuse me. Uh, I think that he's great. I, I do like Christian. I think he was always kind of underutilized. Um, but... And I do, I have to say, I do like that he made it clear that he wasn't, like, worthy of a title shot yet. Um, really, it was Kenny Omega who interrupted him and took his time, so that's the only reason he was out there. And um, and he was going to have to do a lot of work before he got up to that level to be able to challenge Kenny Omega. I like that. That's I think we talked about that last week. I was kind of hoping for that. But I did not, uh, I don't know, it just was just, it just, was just boring. Um like I said, serviceable, and I really think uh, Christian is a victim of the whole overhyping thing. Uh, back to Revolution, and so yeah, I don't, I don't really think this is Christian's fault. I just, I think, like I said, this was a serviceable, serviceable interview. Not much more to say to that. Um, 
I want to see him get in the ring. If he's going to keep talking about outworking everybody or whatever, then get in the ring and, and show us because I don't want to hear anything more from Christian Cage. I just want to see him wrestle and see that he can still go after seven years of being, you know, on the bench. So uh, after the interview, we got into the Moxley and Eddie Kingston match, and the match started off with a ambush from the Good Brothers to Mo- uh, excuse me to Eddie Kingston as he entered uh, down the ramp. And John Moxley is all taped up from obviously the barbed wire death match. That is, I think a lot of people are forgetting how brutal that match actually was because of the pff we got at the end of it. Um, I'm like, what's it called? I'm like trademarking that now is the pff. But um, comes to to help Eddie Kingston and brawls with the Good Brothers. But essentially, you know, Anderson and Gallows get uh, the upper hand on both Kingston and Moxley. This match essentially becomes a squash match for most of it because, um, I mean, obviously these two guys are beat up or especially Moxley is beat up and they got the, uh, upper hand. Um, so it's kind of just really a dominant match, boring, dominant match from the Good Brothers. Uh, towards the end, the Good Brothers attempt the magic killer on John Moxley, but Kingston comes up with a chop block to Anderson Kingston sends Gallo over the top rope into the floor uh, with a running clothesline, and Gallo pulls uh, Kingston out of the ankles and whips him into the guardrail. Moxley rolls up Carl Anderson and pins him for the 1-2-3, and that is the quick recap of the ending, because, again, it just wasn't, like, PG. I, I, th- I don't know if I can say ass on this podcast. You know what? I'm gonna, I think I can, so we're going to go for it. I just, I just wasn't asked about this match. Um... But yeah, inside cradle to to get the win. Another roll up for the night, which is again not very AEW like. But I get it in this uh, in this instance. Obviously, John Moxley is very beat up. The real story though comes after the match. Um, the Good Brothers double team Moxley. Kenny Omega's music hits, and he comes like skipping and dipping out to the uh, ring with a steel chair. Don Callis uh, is with him, and uh, Kingston. Excuse me. Um, Kenny Omega looks like he's about to. Start to beat down Moxley, but then uh, Eddie Kingston comes in and uh, breaks him up. Starts, uh, you know, I think he pushes Kenny Omega off the chair. Um, but then the Good Brothers obviously have the numbers game and just the advantage overall. And they stomp on Kingston afterwards and um, get him uh, over to the corner. Put the steel chair on his ankle and then obviously do the little ankle breaking spot. And then Anderson and Omega place Moxley's head between the chair, and um, Gallows goes up to the top turnbuckle to go for the, I don't know, to kill him, essentially. And then you get the Young Bucks coming out, um, who come out to make the save. And um, this is where, like, the plot thickens a little bit, and I thought this was, like, a great... This was all this story needed for the night. It didn't need that weird backstage promo, but, um, you know, the Bucks basically uh, save uh moxley's life and say like you know just it's supposed to bound to happen because you've got a heel group and a baby face and they're supposedly friends right they're gonna have weird like tension moments like this and this is what you can build off and i thought like this was great storytelling um they don't need to say anything and obviously they're having words back and forth um and uh kenny omega goes to try to do it again and the young bucks come in again and make the save um, and then Omega puts his hand up uh, to do the too sweet thing, and the Bucks resist, uh, and then essentially leave the ring. Uh, and Moxley gets to his feet and just starts swinging the chair left and right. It was funny, and the Good Brothers and Kenny Omega retreat, and that is the end of that segment. And like I said, this was all the story needed to um, continue to progress. I like that. Um, it was a kind of like a good versus evil, like a just this is how we got to the top versus how you're getting to the top now. Kind of similar to, uh, I don't know, for some reason I got this weird, it made me think about that time when Edge came back to WWE to say like, Christian, congratulations on your world title win, but you won it by like spitting in the face of Randy Orton and having him DQ you or get DQ'd. Just to, like a like a heel baby face when, when their friends in or outside of wrestling or whatever in kayfabe you get this special dynamic that isn't done well all the time, but this is this is being done well, I think, for the most part. And so, I like this dynamic. And um, and on to something I didn't like so much. Uh, we had a Tony Schiavone interview with the TNT champion Darby Allen and Sting for I think maybe the fourteenth week in a row, just interviewing Sting every week. It's like, hey guys, AEW, and by the way, Sting is here. 
Like, so sick of this, man. So sick of these quote-unquote Sting interviews. And this week, Sting didn't say a word the entire time. Um, uh, whatever. Darby comes out and says that, you know, I've only defended this title three times. So funny. The crowd was like, woohoo, yay. And no, Darby's like, no, that no, that's bad. I want to defend this every week, essentially. And he pays a little tribute to um, Brody Lee and says that he wants to defend or excuse me, he wants to give an open challenge to anybody in the Dark Order for the TNT title next week. Um, and then Lance Archer and Jake the Snake Roberts come uh, out and interrupt them, and I thought, oh my god, am I having deja vu? Or are they just replaying something from last week? Because this was the same thing as last week, essentially. Um, long story go away, Lance Archer cuts a promo on uh, Sting and says... <clears throat> It, exactly what I was thinking. Like, right, how many times are you going to interview Sting? It should be my time. And Darby, you're the TNT champion. The internet might think you're terrific, but as far as I'm concerned, you're the biggest indie joke this business has ever seen. And I like this. I have to say, I did like this line. And you like coffins so much, well, I'm about to put your ass in one. Uh, and then uh, Jake Roberts takes the mic, and this was this was tough, man says, Sting, you know me and you're going to get what's coming to you. Tony Khan better realize you don't play with fire. The biggest is, excuse me, this is the biggest, baddest son of a bitch here. I don't know if I can say that on this podcast, but I just did. Um, any, I'm quoting. It's a quote. It's a quote. Uh, and he will twist it up and he will shove it up your rear ends. So be careful, boy. I, what? I didn't, this was bad. This was weird and bad. And then let's top it all off, right? Uh, Taz's group comes out and Brian Cage says, like, no, 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 I want I want to say something tonight, Taz. Like, you're not speaking for me. Goes up to Darby Allen and Sting and says, basically, Sting, I respect you. You're still the icon. And I got to say, Ricky Starks was wrong. With or without a bat, you are still the icon. And then, <laughs> actually, again, there was a, a few things in this, this uh, segment that popped me. I think one of the guys in, in Taz's group was like, what what, the, what are you doing, dude? Are you smoking crack or something? like Whatever. It was funny. And they're all like, what's wrong with you? Whatever. And then Brian Cage pushes his way through the group and uh, and leaves through the tunnel. And the, the reason I said Ugh, another thing is because, like, why... Why are we going to break up, you know, or start creating some tension in Taz's group? I love Taz's group. I think it's such a great group of guys, a great dynamic. I understand there's another heel stable now going on, but you also have another baby face stable because the inner circle just turned baby face. So keep this stable going. I get it that in kayfabe it makes sense. You guys took a big loss. There should be repercussions. Again, all kayfabe, but hopefully this is just a little blurb in the in the road and all this group can stay together. And hopefully next week we don't have another Sting interview for no point. Um, I get it. Sting's on AEW. We get it. The icon is on AEW. It snows in Jacksonville, Florida. I don't care. I'm so sick of this stuff, this Sting stuff. The street fight was great, but it wasn't It wasn't good enough for me to just want to see Sting's face every week on, on AEW and bask in the glory of Sting. That just doesn't do it for me as a fan. Um, if there are some people out there who love this nostalgia act a lot, cool. And... um in regards to Darby Allen, you know, I've I've praised Darby Allen on the show before, and I think he can do a lot of great stuff. I, I think he is way more than indie-rific, obviously. Um, and uh, and you know, despite if you are able to put some of the stuff um, that has been you know alleged against him to the side and enjoy what he does in the ring, power to you. I struggle with it sometimes, but um, I'm just so sick of seeing these two guys come out and and do little to nothing. Like let's let's have. Darby Allen wrestle and Sting stop just being like uh like let Sting do great things if Sting can do great things instead of just have an interview every week like it's not it's just such a obvious like ratings grabber and I think it's boring and 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 like I said I think if, if this works for you guys and you guys like the nostalgia act power to you it's just it does nothing for the 22 year old fan right who Sting doesn't mean anything to me um, I know of Sting, I've seen Sting matches, I, I get it, right, um, but it, it doesn't do anything for me because I'm here to watch AEW, not WCW or TNA or whatever, right, so if you want to have Sting have his own legacy in AEW, then have him have his own legacy in AEW, but an interview every week doesn't really lead to that, um, 
All right, speaking of legacies in AEW, we had the Ray Phoenix match with um, Pac versus Angelico. And to make a long story go away with this match, uh, a long back and forth between these two guys, and then uh, Ray Phoenix ends up getting the pin after uh, hitting um, Angelico with a Death Valley driver, I think, and gets the 1-2-3. And I don't know, I, I would have rather seen... Uh, Matt, ja- excuse me, Nick Jackson versus Ray Phoenix, or Matt Jackson versus Ray Phoenix again, honestly, um, or Pac versus uh, Matt Jackson or Nick Jackson. One of the one of the young bucks. I don't care. I would have loved to see more little kind of like one on one stuff. Um, I didn't. This match didn't do a lot for me. Um, I don't know. It's kind of sad because Ray Phoenix had such a high expectations that went, I don't. This just didn't live up to the other matches that he's had. But you put this match on any other show, and uh, and you don't have a lot of knowledge about Ray Phoenix, and you'd be amazed by Ray Phoenix because he's Ray friggin' Phoenix. So, all right, real quick, guys. Now I want to move on to the main event because that is the biggest talking point coming out of this week's Dynamite. Like I said, overall the show just kind of didn't do it for me in most spots. There were some good some good points, but, you know, the main event tied the whole thing together, and I think if it was on a better show, it probably would have even had a better, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, reception. Um, so we're going to go through this match a little bit and, and hit some of the high spots so I can make sure I, again, give as much credit as I possibly can to these two women. Obviously, the first ever main event for the women in AEW, and I couldn't think of any other better women to put in than uh, Britt Baker and uh, Thunder Rosa. You guys have heard me on this podcast. If this is not your first time listening, say that I adore Britt Baker. I mean, I hate her because she's a heel and she does a great job of it, but I think uh, I adore her as a worker. I think she's incredible. I think she is the face of this women's division. I think she has it all going for her. And um, and so, I, like I said, I couldn't think of two better women. And Thunder Rosa, you know, deserves the credit too. Obviously, a, a great, just pure baby face. And um, and so, yeah, so let's get into the details of this match. Um, they start the match with a stare down, and then Rebel blindsides Thunder Rosa, swinging her crutch at her. And then, uh, obviously, Thunder Rosa goes after Rebel, but Britt Baker gets her and uh, follows it up with a air raid crash on the stage, but Thunder Rosa kicks out. Britt Baker hits Thunder Rosa with a chair shot and then does her Typical, wonderful Britt Baker, cocky, you know, stuff, turning back to, into the camera, and that obviously gives Thunder Rosa time to pick up a chair and whack uh, Britt Baker with it. Moving along in the match, though, later on, uh, Thunder Rosa hits a running double knee to Baker in the corner. Excuse me, in the corner. She sandwiches Baker between the ladder and the turnbuckles, and Thunder Rosa drop kicks the ladder, ramming it into Baker's face. Britt Baker is busted open, and I did miss before, too. I love this spot. Britt Baker, like, stomps Thunder Rosa's head against the uh, steps outside, too, and that's when Thunder Rosa gets cut open. A lot of blood in this match, mostly from B- Britt Baker. Um, Thunder Rosa bites, on, uh, bites down on Britt Baker's cut, which was unsanctioned worthy um but Britt Baker retaliates with a thrust kick and hits the flatliner on her um right onto the ladder that looked brutal um both these two women are just like drenched in color uh Baker climbs up the turnbuckles but Thunder Rosa follows her and then uh hits her with a Death Valley driver down onto the ladder Thunder Rosa covers Britt Baker but it's only a two count uh, Baker DDTs Thunder Rosa onto a steel chair and then stomps Thunder Rosa's head onto the chair and then somehow, again, just a near fall. And then uh, she gets the the black glove out and we think, okay, here we go, lockjaw. Instead, Rebel reaches under the ring and what does she grab but thumbtacks? Like, as if this match couldn't have gotten more brutal, more blood, more whatever. Obviously, uh, Britt Baker pours the thun- thumbtacks in the middle of the ring Goes to um, uh, hit uh, Thunder Rosa. I forget what she even tried to do onto the thumbtacks. But Thunder Rosa reverses it. Power bomb onto the thumbtacks. And like, oh, it looks bad. But like, when she turns over and you see how many are in her back, it's just like, I I knew Mick Foley and uh, Terry Funk felt that somewhere. You know, oh, it looked bad. And then they're like, 
uh, rolling around in it later, obviously. Um, Britt Baker later on goes for the lockjaw, and the reversal to it is, like, Thunder Rosa just goes, all right, let me just, like, turn on um, my back, or turn you on your back onto the thumbtacks. Like, that'll end the submission. Long story go away, the... um, the end of the match, uh, Thunder Rosa off the apron, uh, hits her, hits Britt Baker with the Fire Thunder driver through the table, and it looked brutal. I mean, like, half of Britt Baker's body was under the ring. Her hair was drenched in blood. This whole match was unbelievably hardcore, um, and these two women showed up and showed out absolutely. I think an incredible first ever women's main event I mean showed that these women should be able to do all the matches that the men are able to do um and they did not uh excuse me they did deliver they did not disappoint um really intense feud and a great payoff I assume the feud's over considering that the um baby face won that's usually the storytelling beats but um like I said a great hardcore match I can't give this enough credit I'd love to hear what you guys think about this I'm not I love a little color, don't get me wrong, but I I don't need, uh, I'm not a big hardcore, hardcore fan. Like, I like some of the old ECW stuff, but, like, I'm not in it for just senseless violence for senseless violence sake. Um, call it my lack of testosterone, I, I don't know, but I think this match in particular wasn't that. It was violence for uh the sake of the feud not just for senseless violence sake and um and I think these two women had built up a feud big enough that deserved this kind of blow off and they did a great job I mean every move kind of felt like it was done with purpose and Britt Baker like I'm gonna close my eyes tonight and I'm gonna see that image of Britt Baker's face just drenched in blood smiling into the camera oh my god she is unbelievable and I cannot wait for her to um to be the women's champion someday soon, hopefully, but this was awesome, uh, and Thunder Rosa deserves all the credit in the world, but the bumps that these, these two women took, like, on their heads over and over and over in this match, just, uh, I, on a podcast here, could not do it enough credit, so if you didn't watch this match, I always say, go watch it, um, awesome, I do, the only thing I would say about, like, the only thing I would say about it was, I, I was saying, I don't know if anybody else was thinking this, or maybe I missed something, but, like, where was um Nyla Rose and Maki Ito? Like, didn't they just form a stable or something two weeks ago or at Revolution or whatever? And last week they had that tag team match. I, I don't know. I assume, actually, Maki Ito is back in Japan, Um, I think, uh, if I'm correct. But uh, I, I just didn't get that part. I mean, Rebel was out there. Why wasn't the rest? Like, if I had a stable, I'd want them to help me in a match like this. That's unsanctioned. Excuse me. No DQs, obviously. Um. It just seemed like that kind of just dropped. And they also announced a match for Nyla Rose next week but um, versus, I think, Ty Conte, if, I, Ty Conte, if I'm correct. But I, I don't know. That that seemed like a plot hole to me. But nonetheless, I don't want to uh, uh, end this on a low note. I want to end it on a high note and say that this match was incredible. A great ending to a rather mundane, fairly disappointing. I, I think, you know when your parent used to say to you, I'm not mad at you. I'm just disappointed. That's kind of how I felt about a lot of this AEW. I wasn't mad. I was, I was just disappointed because I expect a lot more from AEW. And I really wasn't, um, like, my my fiancé does not watch a lot of AEW with me. And she uh, offered to watch some of it last night. And this was what I had to show her. I would have been much, I would have been much happier showing her last week's show, is my point, I guess. And, um, and yeah, but uh, this main event put a beautiful wrapping paper job and bow on a not so pretty present. So wonderful, wonderful, wonderful main event from the women and uh, an overall average AEW. But hopefully next week the story beats continue. Hopefully the execution's a little bit better and hopefully AEW whips its butt into shape because the ratings for the last two weeks have not been great in comparison. So before we finish up here tonight though, guys, I do want to make sure I get to, uh, I totally forgot until now so I'm glad I remembered but I do want to make sure I get to our email I got an email from DJ Kuzmo uh, about last week's AEW so we're going to talk briefly about that but before we jump into that I do want to say if you guys want to email me your thoughts on AEW or on anything with the highs and lows of the week I do have a couple email f- emails for that um, that we'll talk about on Saturday but uh, you can email me at mimi m-i-m-i dot w-w-e no 
always do that, guys. Every time. Mimi dot real w. All right, last time. Mimi dot real wwe podcast at gmail dot com. Uh, shoot me an email, and I would uh, love to get your thoughts on the show. Obviously, if we have the time for it, and we usually do. So, uh, this was uh, DJ Kuzmo's thoughts about last week. I usually record the show about maybe 24 hours within AEW. So if you want your thoughts on the actual show of that week, if you can get me an email within 24 hours, I will probably feature it on the show. Um, But like I said, this is about last week. And uh, DJ says, uh, Hey Mimi, I'm currently listening to your AEW review show. He also heard some weird background noises during some parts of the AEW last night. And it really was just that Ethan Page match. I, I, I heard that if he had fight TV or whatever, people didn't have a problem with it. But Otherwise, on TNT, everybody did. Oh, it was so bad. I felt so bad for Ethan Page. Um, he says, in the segment with the... Uh, no, excuse me. I'm skipping. All right. He says, anyway, great showing of Ray Phoenix versus Matt Jackson to start the show. It's just a matter of time till Death, Tri- Death Triangle wins the tag team title belt. Oh, I wish, DJ, but I don't think it's going to happen. I think this feud with the um, Good Brothers is going to outweigh uh, whatever pack and... Um, phoenix are doing for now hopefully um later on uh down the line obviously i would say within within the year 2021 that at least one of these guys will hold some kind of gold um i'd really like to see ray phoenix hold a singles title too and pack i I feel like i sleep on pack a lot in this podcast but pack is unbelievable you know just as unbelievable um i'm just you guys know i'm just a big ray phoenix fan um he says in the segment with Moxley and Eddie Kingston, I didn't know, I don't know about you, but doesn't Moxley look wasted? Moxley can be hilarious without trying to be hilarious, if that makes any sense. Uh, yeah, 100% agree. Moxley is hilarious. I think that's like, I. you guys heard me earlier on the show, right? My girlfriend was like, he always looks like he's on drugs or something. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of just Moxley's gimmick. And it works. Um, says sidebar. Doesn't it look like Orange Cassidy is kind of bored in the segment with him and Chuck Taylor versus Kip Sabian and Miro? Orange Cassidy needs to get back to either the upper mid card or main event status with and with and Chuck without Trent feels like he's missing his best friend. No pun intended. Hope to see Trent come back soon. I'm a hundred percent in agreement with you. Uh, I oh you know what I you just reminded me too. I totally missed that whole little Miro segment. Um, Miro and Kip Sabian backstage thing. My guess, I guess we'll cover that now, but my guess as to where this program is going is I assume Miro will squash the both of them next week or they'll lose in some kind of roll-up thing and um, it'll be Kip's fault. Miro will ditch Kip Sabian and I would say we're seeing Miro hold gold within the next year or two as well. Or at least he's in the title picture within 2021. I really think they love Miro, uh, and I don't blame him. Miro can be really talented. I think this is just this gimmick's not letting him shine. And the same goes for Orange Cassidy. I think Orange Cassidy is uh, an amazing gimmick and an amazing character that you never thought would be as big as it is, but it is. Um, it is, and it works. And um, and I think you're right. I think Truck need ch- Truck. If they ever had a couple name, it would be Truck. But no, Chuck needs Trent um, and Orange Cassidy and Miro and everybody just needs to Kip Sabian, whatever, Penelope for They all just need to, like, move on to a separate thing. So, all right. Um, the MJF double heel turn was so good. Brilliant, brilliant. This is why I love MJF's heel heat. Uh, in my opinion, MJF was never a good fit for the inner circle. Uh, inner circle got screwed. I'm so excited for MJF's new stable and the potential new storyline angles. Uh, next week, St. Patrick's Day is going to be awesome. Cody versus Penta, Thunder Rosa versus Britt Baker, the Good Brothers versus Moxley and Kingston, and I'm also excited to see Jade Cargill back in action next week. So, yeah, I mean, we talked about it. MJF is incredible, and he was incredible this week, and this new stable is awesome, and I'm with you. I'm, that's the word I was looking for, I think. Thank you, DJ. Um, angles, the amount of angles that they can do, because this is what happens when you set up a company, right? With all these factions, you know, who's aligned with who, you know, and, and how, um, you can set up matches without having to blow them off before the actual pay-per-view match. It's just such a brilliant way to keep everything interesting, but also keep storylines progressing and not feel like you're just filling TV time. 
these two hours rarely feel like they're just like, oh, we need to fill this amount of time. Like it, I guarantee these guys are fighting for a couple minutes on Dynamite every week, and um, and you can tell like uh, uh, because they they work hard and they obviously uh, have to earn it with their performances on Dark and et cetera, et cetera. So. I'm with you, DJ. I think this MJF thing, uh, I keep calling it the MJF thing, the pinnacle. I don't want to sleep on FTR or Sean Spears or Tully Blanchard. Um, but I think this new stable, um, new heel stable in the inner circle are going to make a uh, a great new uh, continuous angle for the next couple months. And for, for I guarantee for most of 2021, I guarantee we see the storyline go for a long time. So if you would have told me that the inner circle were going to be baby faces a year ago, I would have called you crazy. But it doesn't seem like a better fit than uh, than it does now. And um, with your regards to this show was going to be awesome this week, I was really hoping it was too. But I just it just wasn't for me. Though I have to say, like I said, I do agree with you. Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa this week was incredible. Um, one of the best unsanctioned matches I've ever seen, period. So... That is it for this week, guys, though. Like I said, if you want to shoot me your emails about AEW, please do. Uh, otherwise, I have a couple for the highs and lows this week, too, and we're going to talk about that on Saturday. And so uh, thanks for listening. Hope you have a run- wonderful the Hope you have a wonderful rest of your week, and I will talk to you guys soon.